Well, welcome to our, our kickoff for our conference. Our conference is every year in October. Yep. And this is actually the second time that we've done this. We, ha we did it last year, yeah. right, at Intel. But this is the first time that we've had it here. And um, we're glad to have you, and thanks for joining us. We've got an awesome lineup of speakers. Um, and our theme this year is 2020 vision. Uh, and it's not necessarily, you know, how clearly we can see 2020, but really looking into the future and what the future holds for QA, as well as our industry, ourselves, and how we contribute to the industry. So today actually is the official opening for the call for proposals. So if you want to go into open conference and submit a proposal, we'll, we'll be ready for you. Uh, this is our speaker lineup. As I said, we have a great lineup of speakers, starting with uh, Rachel Lavallo. She's going to be talking about communication. Uh, Bhushan Gupta is going to be talking about some security stuff and mixing that in with Agile. And then we've got Daniel. Daniel's going to be talking also about security. Uh, Sean is going to be talking about communication safety checks. So I found it very interesting that we have two talks on communication, which is really interesting to me because that's really what's going to propel us forward. It's not just the technology and writing scripts, right? It's really about communication. It's the other half of the equation. We also have Yinki Kwong. I haven't seen him here yet, but he's going to be talking about um, complex enterprise projects and how to embed quality in these long waterfall projects that large organizations often have. We've got Matthew, he's going to be talking about maximizing flow in mob programming. And then Tariq is going to be closing up and talking about AI. I just say stuff. I don't know what bits in the future is, but we're going to find out. So, um, so here we go. Because I'm the program chair, I get to start off a little bit and kind of give, set up the stage. And the title of my talk is the strong survive. Anybody ever heard the strong survive before? Sure. Where does that come from? Song. From from a song. A song. Can top, you top 40 song circa late 60s. Yeah, can can you sing that for us? <laughs> You'll pay me not to sing. Oh, okay. I'm serious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Another way of saying that is survival of the fittest was I'm sure we've all heard of that and um, I'm going to dispel both of those, those um, themes and, and thoughts and talk about a new paradigm that we need to embolden in our, in our bodies and our spirits to move forward and survive in today's world. First, I'm going to talk about fossils. Anybody here go get fossils when they were kids? Anybody? Am I the only person? Yeah, I used to go out and we collect these fossils, you know, and bring them home and like, wow, look at this, mom, right? Unfortunately, I lost mine. I don't know where they are. But fossils like this were, what, what kind of fossils are these? Trilobites. They're trilobites, right. And trilobites happen to be from this era called the Cambrian era, which happened 500 million years ago. And so what's relevant about the Cambrian era today is that the Cambrian era is actually when there was an explosion of life, explosion of different life forms. And the reason this happened was because this is when vision, the sense of vision started to develop. Of course, they didn't have complex eyes like we did, but they could see movement or colors or things like that, right? And so when you have organisms starting to begin to see, then they start to be able to see what they can eat. And you have other organisms trying to get away right? And so it led to survival of the fittest. And today I think about all the things that are bombarding us in our world and our technologies that we have. Um, software testing, of course, is part of all of these. Um, and I'm, I think to myself, what will our era be called? What will our, and I think it'll be called the era of acceleration. And the reason I, I say that is because 
it's really, people say that you know, the only change is constant, right? But that's not true. Things are accelerating now. We have accelerating technologies. Things are just building upon each other and, and getting faster and faster, right? We have accelerations in the way that we work in the way that we socialize together. Accelerations in the different things like mobile phones and we're going like this. And, I'm, and the way that we work together, globalization, people working across the world, right? All of these things are changing really, really fast. And then, of course, we have accelerations in the change in the environment, which we're all aware of. So I think that change is accelerating, and it's really going to impact our ability to survive. And I'm going to use this as a good stopping point for the next speaker. And when I come back, I'm going to continue the story, and I'm going to talk about why that I'm going to be standing in between you and the beer at the end. Okay. I've certainly heard a lot of different topics today. I'm going to get back to the strong survive. Um, actually, the strong don't survive. If you look at the bald eagle, the grizzly bear, they're going to die off. So it's the strong really don't survive. Um, so who does survive? Well, cockroaches, they're doing pretty well. Rats, they're doing pretty well. Raccoons, I see them all over the place in our neighborhood. Why are these guys doing well? What do you think? They're adaptable. They're adapting. They're adapting to us, right? And so it's not the strong that survives. Sometimes the strong can die off. And so the question is, how do we adapt to all of these changes? And even if it's not accelerating, I still think there's, it's accelerating. You think it's not accelerating, but I think it really is. Is that we need to learn. That's the number one skill that we need to work on. You think about learning this and learning that, but there's also Learn to learn. And you might say, oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I should learn. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? The thing is, is that our society is not made for teaching us how to learn. Right? We go to high school. Our goals are set off. So you got to get from this grade to this grade. Then you got to go to college. And then society gives us goals, too. Oh, you have to get married, then you have to have kids, right? These are all objectives and goals that are given to us. Yeah, I just came back from a trip to China. You know, if, how many uh, women in here are over 25? Anybody here over 25? If you're over 25 in China and you're not married, you're, you have very slim chance of getting married because that, those kind of goals have already been tossed out. They're there. And so, these goals that are put out for us for learning, you know, you gotta, I got to graduate from high school, I got to get into a good college, right? Those are goals that are given to us. But what happens after that? And so I think that it's really important to develop what I call learning strategy. And a learning strategy, of course, includes all the, the five W's and the H, but also how much, right? And the thing is that each of us learn differently, and there's all kinds of different ways of learning, right? How many people learn best from reading books? Anybody? Some people learn best at home, reading books. And then there's some things that you can't learn reading books, like swimming, like bike riding. If I were give you a, a a book on bike riding, would you know how to ride a bike? No. If I were to give you a book on Chinese and you sat down at home, Joe, and read the whole book, would you know how to speak Chinese? No. There was a book put out by 
Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers. Anybody read this book? I love the book. And he talks about the famous thing in his book is, oh, you got to have 10,000 hours of practice. He brings up the Beatles and all kinds of things about, oh, you got to have 10,000 hours. And the thing that he forgot in there, he doesn't mention, is that you have to have feedback within those 10,000 hours, right? And here's a picture of me swimming. I talked about this in the, in the last conference. And you notice how my, my head, the angle of my head is a little bit looking forward. It's funny though, the reason I'm looking forward is because in China, when you go swimming, it's like, it's like chaos. And you gotta be looking where you're going. Somebody's gonna be running into you. So I have to get rid of this habit. But you notice also that when I look forward, my, my butt is going, drag, I'm start, t changes the angle of my butt in the water. And so my coach, was pointing this out, you know, you got to look, you got to put your head down so that your butt goes up, right? And you can see I've improved a little bit there. My butt's starting to go up. This is, you can see I have a different bathing suit. I keep, I keep going back and I keep trying to improve. Still not quite there, but my butt's getting up a little higher. My head's going down a little bit lower, but also, you can learn from watching other people. You look at her head angle, and you can look at how her butt comes to the surface, so she's floating across the water. So it's not 10,000 hours of practice, 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 right? It's learning from others, getting feedback, getting a coach. And you've heard this, me say this before, it's not practice, with feedback makes perfect, not just practice makes perfect, right? And so when you develop your own learning plan, I like to think of it as a tree structure. And I've heard a lot of topics today that maybe think, okay, maybe I should put that in my learning plan. Maybe that's something that I really need to pay attention to. How many of you have a learning plan? Like you did, okay, I'm a sophomore, I need to complete this. How many of you have a plan like that? Probably not. Do you have a plan on what you're going to learn next week? Do you have a plan on who you're going to talk to and network with to absorb and share knowledge? Do you have a plan how many books you're going to read or conferences you're going to go to? or new subjects that you're going to learn about. Do you have a plan? Maybe not. And I'd like you to take away today to own your learning. Your survival and adaptation to the changes that were, are happening today are all depending on you learning. So map out a plan. This is what I'm going to do this year. This is what I'm going to learn. Maybe it's you want to be a better public speaker. Maybe it's I want to learn automation. I want to be great at Selenium. I'm going to go to this course. I'm going to join this meetup. I'm going to do this. You have to have a plan. It's not going to happen by itself, right? It's so now I get to talk about acceleration a little bit. Acceleration is happening, happening so fast, we don't really understand it. And let me give you an example of the acceleration that's happening. Maybe a thousand years ago, I would have a knife and maybe a spear, and I could walk over here, and maybe I could kill Joe. <laughs> right? Maybe in about, maybe if I was good, I could kill him in, you know, 30 minutes, maybe, like that. But that would be where it ended, because Andy would come over and stop me. Or maybe if I was really good, I could kill Andy, too. <laughs> right? I could kill two people in half an hour. Then 500 years ago, we had guns. OK. Well, maybe I could kill six people or eight people with a gun or a musket. Maybe I could kill one guy, right? Now, you just heard recently that we had another mass killing. Now you have people that can kill hundreds of people in a few seconds. That's acceleration. 
In the 40s, we saw that you could have a couple guys in a plane that could kill millions in a few hours. That's acceleration, right? That's, 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 that's powerful. And now you have the coronavirus, right? We heard about that. Already killed 17 people in a few days. That's also acceleration. Now, if you had somebody skilled enough, they could kill the whole world with a virus. That's scary, isn't it? That's real acceleration. And so what I say to you is that it's not what you can do, it's what you can really learn to do. Because what you can do today, it's going to expire, right? So to adapt, we have to keep learning new things all the time. And the acceleration is only going get, to keep getting faster. I invite you to use PNSQC as part of your learning strategy, part of your learning platform because it's really difficult to learn by yourself in a vacuum. Like I said, you need a coach, you need new ideas. Like today, I've learned a heck of a lot of stuff on things that I need to learn, right? In closing, um, this whole event today is all about opening the call for proposals. The call for proposals started today, actually. We opened uh, our conference proposal system. It's called Open Conference. The deadline is April 15th. I invite all of you to submit papers. Last year we had about 150 submissions. We're adding a different type of paper this year. It's called a technical brief. So a technical brief is a little bit shorter, not as rigorous, and about 20 to 25 minutes of, of a talk rather than 45 minutes or 40 minutes. Uh, we're also continuing the weekend or tomorrow with a acceptance testing workshop in Salem, co-sponsored with the state of Oregon. And then later in the afternoon, um, myself and Brian, the president, is we're going to be giving a workshop on public speaking to help some of you get over that hurdle and um, submit a paper for next year. And with that, uh, we'll see you in October. So thank you very much for coming today and look forward to seeing your abstracts. Thanks.